that identity is a is at minimum a socially no negotiated phenomena. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. So apart from that, there's no agreement whatsoever on the set of pronouns that will be used, and, and they've multiplied beyond anybody's anybody's imagination, I would say, including the people who formulated the legislation. And then there's the fact that you don't refer to people by their pronouns anyways. They're third person pronouns, and so I don't call you he when we're talking. I might refer to you as he if I was talking about you with someone else, so most of the time it's a moot point anyways. Sure. Um, but Dr. Peterson, in the cases where it does matter, right, certainly you could envision, let's not talk so much about federal policy, but perhaps like in an actual like personal day-to-day -day setting, do you think there's a harm? So perhaps you can disagree with like the philosophical principle, the theoretical truth of whether or not identity can change subjectively when to win. But if someone comes up to me and says, you know, I want to be referred to as this, even if I adopt some sort of view that I don't really think fundamentally on a pure theoretical level, they have an understanding of identity, do, does that, do I then choose to harm them or potentially upset them by sticking to my belief about what their identity is? Well, the first thing you'd have to establish is whether or not that would actually constitute harm. Okay. That's the claim. And the person might say, well, you're harming me, but that doesn't provide evidence that you are. It doesn't. People, people presume very often that they're harmed by things that they're not harmed by at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that the mere claim that someone thinks that the way I would address them might harm them gives them the right to enforce by legislation the content of my speech. That just doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't work. And you know, here's something else that's worth noting from a more practical perspective. I mean, um, I've received letters from about 30 trans people. And that's actually a lot, because there aren't that many people. And these are people who, by and large, were very serious about their transformations. And all but one of them agreed with what I was doing, saying, first of all, that they never asked to be represented by the activists who claim to be representing them. Now, so here's a proposition. Right? So imagine that there's a group of people, and that somebody is a member of that group of people. And then that person stands forth as a member of that group and says, because I'm a member of that group, I speak for all these people. Like, actually, no, you don't. The mere fact that you're a member of a group doesn't give you any right whatsoever to speak on behalf of that group. Mm -hmm. you, you need to have legitimacy as a representative. And I don't, I think that, that you can hardly imagine a more pernicious uh, example, say, of racism than to presume that if someone is black, they speak on behalf of all black people. Mm -hmm. All black people are homogenous. They all believe exactly the same thing. Therefore, if you've talked to or met one of them, you've talked to or met them all. With respect, Dr. Peterson, I think I'm referring to cases where the actual people in front of you are telling you, though, that they want to they want to represent themselves a certain way, right? So we can talk about whether or not the activist community is accurately representing actual communities, but I'm wondering, you, you mentioned you don't think like a self-report of like, oh, this is harming me, or I would not be comfortable interacting with you unless, you know, X happened, would not be an accurate way of describing real harm. Are there better metrics we have for real harm? If someone comes up to me and they say, oh, you know, when like, they're feeling too warm in this room, we should leave, you know, do I say, ah, no, like, you don't know how warm you are. That's not something you can know for yourself. That's just a self-report. Well, it would depend on what they were asking other people to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't believe that people have the right to, to impose restrictions on what, not so much restrictions on what I'm allowed to say, but to determine the content of my speech. That's an entirely different thing. And so if it's a matter of the legal principle of whether or not I'm free to determine sure. the content of my speech or the hypothetical discomfort of a hypothetical person, because no one's actually asked me this yet, okay. then I'm going to go with the freedom from compelled speech. Partly, again, because I think that the idea that the government or any other yeah. institution should regulate the content of your speech is absolutely, un it's intolerable. I think you have a strong legal argument, right? So the government probably shouldn't mandate this. That, I'm sure a lot of people might agree with that. I'm still curious though, in this hypothetical scenario that a student did or a person did approach you and they told you they would be harmed or they would be uncomfortable unless you referred to them with a certain pronoun, what would you do? Well, I really have a hard time answering questions like that mm -hmm. because they're asked in the hypothetical. It could certainly and happen. Though. It could, it yeah. could, but my sense, because I'm a clinician, is that I generally handle those sorts of things at the level of actual detail. Mm -hmm. So I would say it would depend on the person, it would depend on the situation, it would depend on why they asked me, it would depend on how they asked me, it would depend on what I thought they were trying to accomplish by the request, it would, de it would depend on whether or not they were filming me while they were asking me whether they asked me in my office or in a hallway. 
Now, I can tell the difference between a genuine plea for understanding and a bit of political theater or political manipulation. Now, and I've dealt with people who've made all sorts of requests of me, believe me, because I've had a clinical practice for about 20 years, and my experience with, with the range of human behavior is, I would say, extraordinarily extensive. And so I've made all sorts of adjustments to the way I interact with people. So I can't say exactly what I would do in a given situation because I firmly believe that the devil is in the details. And I haven't been making a case about a, a specific interaction that I had actually uh, experienced or, yeah. or, 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 or yeah, experienced. I've been making a case, a philosophical, fundamentally yeah. a philosophical case, and, and secondarily a political case, and I think that I've made the case properly. But you would say that you recognize a difference between a like legal responsibility to do something versus a sort of an individual personal choice, I should do something, well, right? Well, sometimes I recognize that. I mean, sometimes yeah. the legal and the philosophical and the personal issue are all the same. It's simpler when that's the case. But I also think that the issue is essentially a red herring. I mean, look, since I made that video for one reason or another, things that I've been saying have become quite popular and, and not as controversial as you might think. Most of what I've approved so far has been support. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that has very little to do with the issue of pronouns. The, the pronoun issue and the pronoun controversy is a pointer to something that's a lot larger, and that's why this issue has had legs. I'm not here because people are interested in my views on pronouns. Mm -hmm. Now, I happen to put my foot down, so to speak, at a particular place, because it's very frequently the case that if you're engaged in a complex philosophical dispute, which is the case for our society in general, that in order to make, a, to make a statement about it, you have to make a statement in relationship to an actual cause. So you have to draw the line somewhere. And people have asked me, well, why did you pick the pronoun hill to die on? And my answer to that generally is, A, I didn't die, and B, you have to, and B, you have to, you have to pick something real yeah. to, to enter into the debate. So for sure. example, if I would have just made another video decrying political correctness, it would have gone nowhere at all. Mm -hmm. But I said that there was something I wouldn't do. And one of the things I won't do is use the made up words of postmodern neo-Marxists who are playing a particular game with gender identity that's an extension of their particular reprehensible philosophy. And if that happens to mean that um, I have to engage in discussions about whether or not if a, you know, if a, a, a suffering and confused person who's had a, who's had a very like troubled pathway through life came and asked me politely if I would go out of my way to accommodate them. I, I think that, I don't think that those issues actually belong on the same, in the same, they're, they're not the same category of issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, uh, so, so I don't see that there's, well, I guess that's enough said about that. All right. Let's transition a little bit. So you mentioned sort of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. In fact, in a statement at McMaster University, you claimed that an expression of that the protests that you see at your events are an expression of a philosophy that's grounded partly in postmodernism and partly in Marxism. Yeah. What does that mean, first? And secondly, how would you say that these movements are characterized in those ways? Well, at McMaster, it meant that some of the protesters came with, came and hid behind a banner that had a hammer and sickle on it. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, that, you know. <laughs> see, see, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that people laugh about that, and, and I understand perfectly well what, why you're laughing. But I can tell you, you wouldn't have laughed if it would have been a swastika. Mm -hmm. And it's no, no, it's no funnier that it was a hammer and sickle. You know, the the the, the, the the reprehensible ideologies that are based in, in fundamental Marxism killed at least 100 million people in the 20th century, and they're still apologists. One in five social scientists identifies as a Marxist. It's like, really, really, that's really, that's really where we're going to take this, is it? After the bloody 20th century, we're going to say, well, that wasn't real communism or something foolish like that, even though we had multiple examples of exactly what happens when those doctrines are let loose in the world. And so what, what happened in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, as far as I can tell, and this happened mostly in France, which has probably produced the, the most reprehensible coterie of public intellectuals that any country has ever managed, is that in, in, the, in the late 1960s, when all the student activists uh, had decided that the Marxist revolution wasn't going to occur in the Western world, and, and, and had finally also realized that apologizing for the Soviet for the Soviet system uh, was just not going to fly anymore, given given the tens of millions of bodies that had stacked up, that they performed a, what I would call a philosophical sleight of hand and transformed the class war into a 
you know, into an identity politics, politics war. And that became extraordinarily popular, mostly transmitted through people like Jacques Derrida, who became an absolute darling of the Yale English department and had his pernicious doctrine spread throughout North America, partly as a consequence of his invasion of Yale. And what, like happened with the, what, what happened with the postmodernists is they kept on peddling their, 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 their murderous breed of, of political doctrine under a new guise.